good morning, Grace Church. Glad to be here this morning. I want to welcome those of you who are here for the first time. Um, We're so glad that you're here. So Ed Beck was um, an all-American basketball star. He, uh, He was on a national championship basketball team, and he went on to later become a pastor and a chaplain for the U.S. Olympics. Ed knew what it meant to train hard. He knew what it meant to win the gold, and he knew what it meant to stand on the highest pedestal in sports. You see, this was his aim in life. This was his goal. This is what he lived for. But that all changed one day when he attended a nearby race at the United States Special Olympics. You see, it was evident that he had a life-changing experience as he watched people with physical and mental limitations compete. Ed noticed that instead of the stress and the strain that came along with the world-class Olympic sports, these Olympians of all ages, of all races, uh, from around the world, that these Olympians were infused with a spirit of joy and camaraderie. At one point during the day, eight special Olympians lined up for the 100-yard dash. And at the sound of the gun, they charged the starting line, and suddenly a small frame boy fell to the ground, and he began to cry. And what happened next was the most beautiful thing. You see, some of the runners, without saying a word, they stopped, and they turned back to help their fallen friend. One girl bent down and she kissed the injured boy's knee and said, that will help it feel better. And then they joined hands together and at the roar of the crowd, they walked around the track together and they finished the race together. Rightly so, the judge awarded them all winners that day. I have a question for you. I have a question for you today. When it comes to playing the game of life, what picture best describes your aim? Is it the heated competition of the Olympics, every person for themselves, or is it the community found in the Special Olympics where we're all in it together? For much of my life, I thought about me, number one, not only in sports and in competitions, but in everything and anything in my life. You see, I'm that competitive person. It wasn't back in the day about others or walking hand in hand with anybody. Whether I played tennis or Monopoly or the game of life, the race was on and I played to win. Maybe some of you know what I'm talking about. Tell me I'm not alone. Ah, good. I got an amen back there. I see that. So for many of it's true. And you know what? It started way back in the day. It started when we were young. It started when I was young and affecting all of my relationships beginning in preschool. Like, tell me who didn't elbow their way up to be line leader. Or who didn't jockey for the position of captain, even if it was dodgeball or simple relay races, right? I mean, we have this in us. And then we grow up and we go into the workforce and we put our energy and we put our effort into climbing the the corporate ladder. Doesn't matter whose shoulders we step on, doesn't matter whose head we step on, but it's all about us getting ahead. Some of us have even done this as followers of Jesus, where we have felt driven in an unhealthy or prideful way i got to tell you, it's just a miserable way to live. But here's the deal. The more that I learned, the more that I read about the life and the words and the works of Jesus, something began to change in me. Something began to change. You see, I began to wake up to a different aim in life. A different aim that had different possibilities about not only how I viewed myself, but how I viewed other people. And then 
When I heard stories about this one, like the Olympians, it tugged at my heart. It tugged at my heart, drawing me into a new way to relate to people and to define success. You see, instead of being driven, I began to feel led. And as I have followed, I have begun to find that the real award-winning God-designed life was not about competition with others, but about communion with Christ and others. Communion with Christ and communion with other people. You see, when Jesus' competitive disciples were arguing over who would be his right-hand man in the kingdom of God that Jesus was going to establish, Jesus said this. He says, among you, it will be different. Whoever wants to be the leader among you must be your servant. Jesus, you see here, he redefined greatness as servanthood, not superiority. He says, those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. Now, here's what I know. I know that this sounds completely countercultural, counterintuitive, and I want to tell you something. It is. It is. It may also seem impossible. And can I tell you something else? It is. It is if we rely only on our own strength and on our own effort alone. You see, this life of following Jesus and serving others can only be done in the power of the Holy Spirit. That's the only way. We can't do it on our own. But here's what I want to tell you. Where God guides, God provides. There is power available that says we can do all things God calls us to do if we give the Holy Spirit control of our lives. I want us to look again at our anchor verse for this series. We're in the last part of this series today. And this first co verse comes from a leader named Paul who wrote to first century followers of Jesus who we can still learn from today. It's in Ephesians 5, 18 to 21, and it says this. Don't be drunk with wine because that will ruin your life. Instead, be filled with the Holy Spirit, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs among yourself and making music to the Lord in your hearts. And give thanks for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And further, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Now, over the last weeks, we have been unpacking all of these verses line by line. The first week, you'll remember that Pastor Arlene was here, and she helped us with the first line, don't be drunk with wine because that will ruin your life. Instead, be filled with the Holy Spirit. You see, when we get filled and we stay filled with the Holy Spirit, we will live so differently than the rest of the world that it may appear that we're intoxicated with a life-giving uh, spirit. The second week, we studied together the second phrase about how we can stay connected to God um, with our hearts and minds as we give thanks singing psalms and hymns, giving thanks for God, uh, I'm sorry, singing psalms and hymns and the spiritual songs among yourself and making music to the Lord in your hearts. Remember that? We talked about creating that space for private worship and we talked about corporate worship and having a song in our heart. Last week, Pastor Wes was here from the Cape Coral campus and it was awesome. Was it awesome? It was amazing. For those of you who are here. And he challenged us to develop a life of gratitude that changes our own hearts and minds as we give thanks for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Remember last week, Pastor West challenged us to do a five-minute journal. Who did it? Five things that you're grateful to. Two th one thing that you're, that's bothering you and two things that's going to make today a great day. Well, we have one more phrase that we're going to unpack together today, and we'll discover that the Holy Spirit not only awakens our relationships with God and ourselves, 
but also with other people. We're going to look at some of the most challenging words in all of the Bible as we talk about relationships. I want to look again at these instructions on being filled with the Holy Spirit. Last verse, and further, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. I just got to say this. I don't know about you, but when I hear the word submit, there's something in the back of my neck, my hair goes up, okay? Um, but I'm going to try to change that for us. Not so much anymore. Yeah, I see you guys giggling out there too. So, so, so listen up, because this is good. Let me first tell you that in the Greek, in the Bible, this word is called hypostasis. And what it means is it means choosing to place our needs, choosing to place our needs underneath the needs of others. To, to willingly choose second place or to yield to another person. It was often used as a Greek mili military term talking about being placed under the command of a leader. So are you catching this? You see where we're going here, right? Followers of Jesus choose to submit to one another, not because they have to, but because they want to. And this, this ranges to from, um, from easy to near impossible in my life anyways. And it's depending on the relationship and who we're talking about exactly. Some people in our lives, you might know, um, you know, uh, some people are, are, are those positive people in, in our lives. They're life-giving. They're encouraging people who love us and who support us and who cheer us on. And when you're with them, you feel like your tank is full. You feel like your soul has been renewed. You know those people that I'm talking about, right? You know them. Okay. And then I think, I, when I think about these kind of people, I think about my leadership coach. His name is Dave Owens. And when I get bogged down with relational problems and issues, and when I feel defeated, he lifts me up. He doesn't let me complain for too long. Instead, this wise man of God launches into prayer, and he gives me advice and guidance, and he brings out the best in me, which is what I really need. Amen? There are people in my life and yours that bless us, that help us, that make us feel encouraged. Don't you love people like that? I mean, I, those are the people that I want to be around, and I thank God for those people who encourage people as we encounter in life. But let me tell you something else. Here's the more difficult one. There are other people in our life that are not that easy. Instead of life givers, I like to call them extra grace required people or EGRs. EGRs. It's a Rick Warren thing. Um, so, so let me ask you, do you know any of these people in your life? These people who drain you and discourage you? Yeah, oh, I'm so glad we're not alone this morning. So for me, I'm going to give you my personal list, okay? Don't judge. No judging. For me, EGR people are the know-it-alls. You know, it's those people who have opinions about people in situations that they know nothing about. The critic, who no matter how good things are going, they look for and point out shortcomings and flaws. The negative Nancys, their cup is always half empty, and they're going to tell you about the crack in it. The, 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 the thin-skinned people who are easily offended and always throwing pity parties. My last one on the list, I'm sure there's more, is the bossy. You know, those who are always telling other people what to do. So... This is my list, no judgment. You can pray for me. But uh, I'm sure you have a list too, if you would just think about it for a minute. So here's the question. What do we do with our relationship with those people as well as those people who have hurt us deeply? How would God have us handle those relationships? How does a Holy Spirit-empowered follower of Jesus navigate these words of submission especially 
when it comes to those EGR people. In other words, and here's the question for today, it's in your message notes, how can I live an awakened life in my relationships? How can I live an awakened, spirit-filled life in my relationships? Well, today, we're going to look at another one of Paul's letters to um, follow this trajectory of submission when it comes to living an awakened life in our relationships. And here, we're going to see two decisions that we can make to live a Holy Spirit awakened life in our relationships. Number one in your message notes is choose to submit my life to Christ. Choose to submit my life to Christ. Here's the deal, gang. Before we can talk about relationship with other people, we need to begin with our relationship with God. We have to begin there. We're going to look at some scriptures written to new believers in the region of Galatia, which is modern-day Turkey. During Paul's visit to that region, many people had responded to the grace of God given through Jesus' life, his death, and resurrection. They were set free from the law, and they were set free from sin to begin to live this new life empowered by the Holy Spirit. This is really important. Because after Paul left, some Jewish Christians came back into the region teaching that in order to follow Jesus, this meant that they had to follow the Jewish law. They taught that salvation was found through human effort and ability, a message that was contrary to what Paul had told them when he was there with them. And to correct this false teaching... Paul says in chapter 5, verse 1, wake up. He says, wake up. He says, so Christ has truly set us free. Now make sure that you stay free and don't get tied up again in slavery to the law. You see, we don't earn salvation or God's love. We only choose whether or not we're going to receive this gift. And when we accept this gift, we are set free from the power of sin and death. And friends, that's good news for us. A new spirit is at work in and through us through the gift of Christ, and we become awakened. This freedom encompasses all parts of our life. And since we're no longer under the power of sin, we don't have to meet the expectations of others. We don't have to compete with or strive to outdo others any longer. Instead, we're invited to live for God's glory alone. You see, Jesus, he didn't live his life trying to make others happy and earn their approval. He trusted in the love of his Father. He was confident in that love. And when we say yes to Jesus... We are asking that his life begins to live out in our own through the power of the Holy Spirit. And then we can also live in this same confidence that we are loved by God unconditionally. Even when God corrects us, even when he were disciplined. You see, because God's love is, and motivation is always love. Pure love. Unconditional love. Rather than inviting you and I to go back to the law and to keep the rules, God invites us into a relationship where God will reveal a love that is superior to anything we have ever experienced. No other love will fully satisfy our souls. Jesus Christ wants to fill you with his love. The greater amount of love that fills our hearts, the freer we become and those EGR people's opinions and criticism and insults and negativity don't have to wear us down. Only when we've chosen to submit our lives to Christ and have started experiencing this amazing divine love and grace are we ready to then talk about 
other people. So how can I live an awakened life in my relationships? I want you to look with me at the second choice, number two. Choose to freely submit to one another in love. Choose to freely submit to one another in love. Here's what I want you to notice here. I want you to notice that this is a free choice. A choice to freely submit because we are free in Christ. Once Paul reminds his friends of their freedom in Christ, he then describes to them how to live into that. I want you to look with me at Galatians 5, 13 through 15, and it says this. For you have been called to live in freedom, my brothers and sisters, but don't use your freedom to satisfy your sinful nature. Instead, use your freedom to serve one another in love. For the whole law can be summed up in this one command, love your neighbor as yourself. But if you are always biting and devouring one another, watch out. Beware of destroying one another. You know, it's funny that the church is one of those places where people get hurt in relationships. It's the very people that God calls us to love one another. We end up hurting others oftentimes. You see, our freedom is not to satisfy our sinful nature and get trapped in the bondage of slavery again. We've been set free. Our freedom is to be used to serve one another and to love just like Jesus loved. Paul tells us plain and simple. He says, love your neighbor as yourself. And frankly, for some of us here, we have to first learn how to love ourselves. Amen? Some of us have to first learn how to love ourselves. But what I want you to notice here in verse 15 is that Paul also gives us a warning. He says, watch out and be aware that you don't damage and destroy one another in your relationships. Because the reality is we hurt one another. And whether it be with our actions or our words, we hurt each other. And whoever said sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me, obviously, they never had a social media account and they never dealt with a bully. Because the reality is words can and do hurt. Yet God has called us to love as Jesus first loved through our lives and together as part of the church. A Holy Spirit empowered revolution of God can invade our homes, it can invade our neighborhood, our churches, and this world. But here's the deal. It begins here in my heart. It begins in your heart. That's where it begins. And then from there, we can spread it through our community and throughout the world. You see, instead of seeking to empower each other, to compete against each other, to criticize each other, or gossip about each other, we are called to put that aside. And instead, we're to love one another. This was the mark of the early Christian followers. That's how people knew that they were Christians. People were watching and they were amazed at how these Christians were loving their neighbors, especially the people nobody else wanted and nobody else saw. And so my question is, what could happen if a dozen or a hundred or a thousand of us asked the Holy Spirit to fill us so much that we could actually submit to one another, that we can place ourselves under one another? And what does that look like to do that? What would it look like for that to happen? Instead, what if we were to reach out to strangers and care for the hurting and love even our enemies? That would be revolutionary. That would be living like Jesus. Now, I want to just take a minute to say a word about abusive and dangerous relationships, okay? Abusive and dangerous relationship. This love that we're called to extend does not include putting yourself at risk. 
nor does it mean being a doormat to be as anyone chooses. If you're dealing with an abuser, the greatest act of love you can give yourself and the person who is abusing you is to say, enough. Please, get help. You may be also wondering, on another note, well, what if a boss or someone in power is asking something wrong? What do you do then? How do you submit then? Here's the simple answer. The submission that we're talking about is ultimately to Christ. If it violates Jesus' life and teachings, we, ne- we may need to take a courageous stand. What about hurtful people? How do we deal with them? What we know is that hurting people hurt others. The challenge for me in a relationship that goes sideways is first one of self-control. You see, my first instinct is not to love, but to go back to them. And I know that that's not the way to go. To get back at them is not the way to go. It's not, it's just, it's not Christ-like. So what do we do in those situations? Here's what I found. I found that the Holy Spirit can give us the power and discernment to look beyond the behaviors of the person. In other words, don't only look at the problem, but find the pain. Seek the why. You see, I've learned to want and to have a desire to learn more about those EGR people in my life. I want them to know that I care about them. And, I, and when I see their pain and when I feel their pain, it's a whole different ball game. I shared just the other day with some folks that this is exactly what I do. And I want to encourage you to try it. Get to know their story. Friends, the message for today is not Christian codependency. It's not about that. You see, Jesus willingly gave his life. It was not taken from him. Jesus didn't heal to draw a crowd, and he didn't teach to get an applause. He lived for God's glory, and those who knew him best described his character as exactly what the Holy Spirit wants to produce in our lives. Paul describes the fruit that the Holy Spirit produced in Jesus. And this fruit will also be evident in an awakened, spirit-filled follower of Jesus. I want you to look with me at Galatians 5, 22 and 23. It says, but the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Read it with me. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There is no law against these things. So remember that it's out of freedom, not compulsion, that we serve one another. And here's what I want to do today. Today, I want to invite us to be fruit inspectors of our relationships. How are we doing? I mean, how are we doing this? Are we loving? Are we at peace with one another? Are we giving people? Are we patient? Are we kind? Let us be fruit inspectors this week. What fruit is being produced in your life? I want you to take a look at the scripture again. Look at it. Put it back up, Jim. Look at it. Do you need more of the Holy Spirit in your life to do this? I know I do. If you don't see fruits of the Holy Spirit, then here's what you need to do. You need to feed the roots. Give more nutrients to your soul's root system. Dive deep into God's word revealed in scripture. Make more time for stillness and silence to rest in God's love. And what you'll discover is that the Holy Spirit will meet you in these places of healing and bring freedom to your life and to relationships with others even those difficult people. So how can I live 
an awakened life in all of my relationships, I can choose to submit to another in love. But remember the first step. First, we need to choose to submit our lives to Christ. By the power of the Holy Spirit, let us wake up to a new way of living instead of competing and racing against one another in the game of life. Let us ask God to fill us with the Holy Spirit. Let us ask him to fill us that we can hold hands with one another and that we can go to the finish line together. Would you stand with me as we pray? So Father, this morning... We recognize that we can't just do this in our own strength. And we need you, Lord. We need the power of your Holy Spirit in our lives. And so this morning, we come before you. And first and foremost, Father, we invite you to be Lord of our lives. That we might first and foremost submit to you and to your ways. And Lord, when we do this, would you help us? Would you fill us that we can love others like you first loved us? Lord, that we can put others before ourselves, that we can give up the, the, front, the front seat in the car, that we can, we can give the last piece of pizza, that we can not race to be the line leader, but that we can humbly submit to one another because we choose because you chose to submit to the Father. Father, this morning we give you thanks. We give you thanks. We bless you. Help us. Fill us. Pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen.